book of 1 Timothy is a pastoral epistle written by Paul the Apostle. It's one of his final letters to his protege and spiritual son, a young pastor named Timothy. And although the letter is intended for his ministry life, the content transcends and applies to the Church of Jesus Christ. Within this letter is the most explicit and complete instructions for church leadership and administration. Not only is the Christian's character of utmost importance, but also the church's culture is of spiritual significance. From the qualifications of elders and deacons to the quality of the times and seasons, this letter teaches the believer to guard the truth of the gospel against spiritual treason. And that is why 1 Timothy is a perfect template to follow for life and ministry. Because when we submit to the inspiration and course correction of this letter, the church will be pure, her people bolder, and the gospel clearer. The book of 1 Timothy. Dear church, this is your charge. All right, dear church, this is your charge. My name is Matthew Mary. If you're joining us for the first time, either in person or online, God bless you. Thank you for your support from a distance or in person as we study the scriptures together. We are in the book of 1 Timothy as prefaced. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there in advance. Thank you for bringing your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we, will, we would gift you a Bible. There is one in the seat in front of you. Grab it now and find your way to 1 Timothy. We've made our way through two chapters. We'll continue where we left off last Sunday, again, all of our messages can be found on our website and or YouTube page, those installments. My hope is that you are taking advantage of our resources, and if you've missed a message, catch up on it as the week unfolds so you can study the scriptures fresh and anew where we left off and where we're picking up. All right, let me say this. No rabbit trails this morning, amen? No rabbit trails this morning. My goal is to cut it straight and walk down the path, of course, in the midst of a field of landmines. And that is why I need to be on that path as the Lord leads. But I want to encourage our men and our women, our husbands and our wives, our fathers and our mothers, and I wanna encourage our boys and our girls. And I said it that way because you can no longer say that in Disney World. And the church is redeeming that because we believe in gender-specific responsibilities and roles. Amen. Amen, thank you, yes. I'd also like to say it's okay to clap in church. It's okay to say amen. You just can't say a woman in church. Okay, if you remember, what Paul is writing to Timothy is for the church. It has corporate application. It's for the assembly of believers when they come together. Our God is a God of order. The church takes her cue from scripture, not culture. And if we understand that, we will understand why there are worldviews that are at odds and they're conflicting. And the church is supposed to know who she is. She is the bride of Christ. Christ is the groomsman. Christ is the head. And by way of example, and how he led, and how he served, and how he discipled, that is where we take our mark. That's not just for the men, that's also for the ladies. If you remember, Paul says to Timothy, two gender-specific, physical, commandments that roll over to spiritual enablements, physical commandments. Men, I will that you would lift up holy hands, praying without anger or argument. That's a physical commandment. However, not to be disassociated from a spiritual enablement. What good would it be to raise holy hands physically and then live opposite of that posture of surrender, spiritually, emotionally, practically. He then turns and says to the women, in like manner, ladies, be mindful of what you're wearing physically, physical commandment, why? Because he's hoping that it will roll over to a spiritual enablement. 
with the same energy that we adorn ourselves outwardly. He is suggesting, he is commanding, he is prodding that we would adorn ourselves inwardly. So men, we are not called to keep up with the Joneses. Ladies, you are not called to keep up with the Kardashians. Church, we are called to keep up with Christ. All right? That means it's not sinful to take care of yourself nor is it sinful to have means and resources. That's not what's being said in any of these passages. What is being said is that we are to be rich towards Christ, in Christ. We are to be beautiful or beautified towards Christ or in Christ. Remember, in God's economy, it's not about the outward, but the inward. However, the inward makes its way outward, which means the outward is evidence of the inward. Did you get that? It's not about the outward, it's the inward. However, the inward makes its way outward, which is then the evidence of what's happening on the inside of me. God looks at the heart, indeed, but make no mistake, our behavior, our conduct, is the way our heart bleeds. We say, I wear my heart on my, my sleeve. That's true whether you wanna realize it or not. Some of us like to hide our emotions, but they eventually will make their way out. That is why Proverbs 4, 23 is so crucial, critical. Above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from your heart. Everything about your life as a man, as a woman, is derived in your heart. The makeup of your heart, how you keep or tend to your heart. The Christian is to garden the heart Make sure no weeds find their way into the garden of the heart. If you have an interest, a gifting in botany, and you keep a garden, you know what it takes. The energy, the attention to detail, monitoring the weather, and all of these are physical, but they help us understand the spiritual. Now I wanna begin with two graphics. You will have them in your app notes really just a way of, of tapping back into that vein from last Sunday and showing you scripturally how men and women alike have equality at creation. However, men and women alike have different equity even at creation. For example, Genesis 1:27. So God created man, that's mankind, that's the human race in his own image. That's equality in the image of God he created him. In fact, there's no Hebraic word for him. That's how we know that that line can be connected to the original line. God created man, human, mankind. And then a distinction in the same verse. Genesis 127, male and female, he created them. Did you see that? It starts with equality. All of us have intrinsic value in God's economy. There's equality at creation. However, different equity, different assets, different roles, different distinctions, as it's worded, maleness and femaleness. Right there. Before we get out of chapter one, Genesis 2.23, of course, the second chapter, God has created Adam and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and then from Adam, he creates Eve. From Adam comes Eve, and Adam said when he sees Eve, this is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. Translation, she is just like me. She looks just like me. Contrary to all the other animals that Adam, with the authority God gave him, named. Do you remember how it went? He looked out and saw all types of male, female animals, but there was none like him. And God puts him to sleep, and from his rib, from his side, in essence, creates a woman. Adam sees her, she's like me, and then poetically exclaims, she shall be called, and I, I think here's why he, he, he landed on this, because he saw her. Whoa. He actually said, whoa, mine? And no, God was like, no, woman. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. This is distinction. She's like me, but she's not. She looks like me, but she's different. 
We move to equality at redemption. I'll show you how, not just at creation, the same dyna dynamic at redemption. Equality at redemption, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is salvation. Everyone in Christ, the playing field is leveled at the cross. That's Galatians 3.28. This verse cannot be misappropriated and applied to gender roles and responsibilities as movements have attempted. That's equality at redemption. Now, different equity, however, at redemption. Watch this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, almost the entire chapter, but verse 18 speaks of a body and many members, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. All in the body, equality, different members of the body, different equity, different roles and responsibilities in the body. Are you seeing this? Now let's go to Ephesians chapter four, verses four to seven. Taken in one fell swoop, then there is one body and one spirit, equality. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, equality at redemption. Verse seven, but to each one grace was given according to the equity in Greek, according to the measure of Christ's gift, Christ chooses the different equities in his body and who is going to be used as a hand and as a foot and as a mouth. No member of the body can say to the other, what's the purpose? You're not needed. No, when the body is firing on all cylinders in the church from the head, who is Christ. Each of us have different roles and responsibilities to play. I wanted you to see that in written form. As simple as I could make it, equality at creation, but different equity at creation. Equality at redemption, but different equity, different roles and responsibilities at redemption. Now, equity is given solely by God's authority. And that is why the enemy wants you to think independently of God's authority. Every movement, every counter ideology has an element of thinking independently of God's authority. Doesn't matter how they got there, when you boil it down, when you distill it to its basic substance, what is revealed is that it is independent thought, culturally driven, religiously driven, socially driven, but not scripturally driven. God's authority is binding, does not change. When it comes to gender, God's authority and divine design for gender is binary. Binding and binary. Bi binary means two, and that's why we say binary is male, female. Remember, scripture assigns gender difference which is why the culture forces gender indifference. The culture wants to blur the lines between gender. In the church, the argument that has taken shape has two camps. And you might not need to know this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. It's the egalitarian thought versus the complementarian thought. And I want you to know these are two new terms in the course of the last, let's say, 50 years, in the 70s, when there was a movement and it was built upon feminism, there was a Christian contemporary of that movement called evangelical feminism, okay? And they needed to define the terms that there was not just equality in the body, there was equity in the body, same equity. That if a man can do it, then a woman can do it. And then if a woman can do it, a man can do it. And they were blurring the lines. They chose to call that movement an egalitarian movement. In short, egalitarian means non-binary, that gender does not matter. Look at me, gender does not matter in the home and gender does not matter in the church. Contrary, complementarian thought says that gender does matter. Both believe in equality. The church should be those that push equality in God's sight. However, the church is also the ones given the commandment from God 
that men and women complement one another. Now, let me be very clear, because I'm gonna talk about headship this morning. In a husband and wife relationship, headship that is designated for the man simply means that he is the spiritual director or superintendent of his home and what has been entrusted to him. He's the responsible agent, spiritually speaking. It does not mean that every man and every woman stereotypically fits a certain mold. The man is only supposed to work and the wife must stay at home. The man does all the accounting because he's good with numbers and the wife just makes sure the meal is on the table. That is not headship. Because in certain dynamics, the wife might be better with numbers and she should handle the finances. And the wife might care to do the, law, the, the yard work. She might enjoy that. The man might not. The man might enjoy cooking. Are you understanding? The man might enjoy laundry. <laughs> the man might enjoy cleaning. Now, this is where you gotta understand, you have to learn your spouse. But headship can only be designated to the man and his spiritual responsibility is to set the spiritual direction and course of his home. It also means you talk about how you're discipling your children. It doesn't just fall on one party. In fact, in the early years when you have children, the mother is the primary discipler of her children. You don't wanna know why? Because we don't have any milk. I'm serious, and we're not really needed other than to support our wives as moms. But as time goes on, what you discover is the dad might become the coach in that dynamic. The mother stays discipling, and the father comes as the authority figure and helps coach up their daughter or their son. Is this making sense? I just don't want you to leave here thinking that headship is something that it is not. See, when the word of God is not the divine order that determines human order, the result is always disorder. And that is why God's creative order, which is what we're after, is intended to bring order to creation. Think about that. God's creative order does what? Brings order to creation. This is reflected in the home, and this is reflected in the church. Now here's the pivot. The perfect expression of this, of course, is pre-Genesis 3, before the fall. When you read it very carefully and closely, Genesis 1, people have often tried to use Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and pit them against each other. It seems like they're different creative narratives. I'm like, no, it's not. Genesis 1 is like an aerial view. The Lord is showing you the seven days of creation, six each day, has its agent of creation. The sixth day, he created man and woman, male, female, and then the seventh, he rested from his work. And what he's doing is giving you a panoramic view, chapter one, and then chapter two, he zooms in. He takes the lens out and he zooms in on his crown of creation in the garden. And that is why you get a little bit more details about Adam and Eve in Genesis two. And let me say this while it's on my mind, and there's a reason why in Genesis two, we get the marriage between the first man and the first woman. And this idea that, get this, the man, the man is to leave his mother and father and cleave to or cling to who? His wife, why the man? Because the man is given authority to start his own household, previously under the headship of his father, and he is leaving his home, and he's claiming a wife, and he is now the head of his home. It doesn't say that for the, for the woman, because she is going from the headship of her father to the headship of her husband. Are you seeing this? Let me go a little bit more biological on you. There's a reason why the male chromosomes are XY. What's that got to do with this? Everything, the creative order is embedded perfectly in creation. XY chromosomes and from the woman, from the man, excuse me, came woman who has XX chromosomes. If the woman came first with XX chromosomes, there'd be no man. <laughs> oh. I'm just saying, right there in our own chromosomes, it tells you the creative order. Now, when the creative order is inversed or, or reversed, 
It's the result of the curse. And yes, it rhymes, because I want you to remember it that way. When the creative order is inversed or reversed, it's a result of the curse. Let's go to that verse, Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, this is God speaking to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Underline this, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. This is not a good thing. This is one of the consequences of sin. This is the relationship out of balance. This is the woman having a unhealthy desire to be her husband. This is why I chose to call these messages spiritual transgenderism. The woman's desire is to usurp headship as a result of the fall. And what is the husband's response? He submits her forcefully. With equal force, just as sinful, just as out of balance, he he meets her head on, pun intended, and there is a clash How do we know it's translated this way? One chapter ahead, stay with me. Genesis chapter four, verse seven. Keep your eyes on Genesis 3.16. Let me read to you Genesis 4.7. Cain's sacrifice was rejected by God. Abel's was received. God says to Cain, what's the problem? Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. When you put those two verses together, your desire is for your husband and he shall rule over you with Genesis 4, 7. Its desire, sin's desire is to dominate you, but you should dominate it. It's not a positive. Same words are applied. This shows me the beginning of what is known as the battle of the sexes. Do you wanna know where the battle of the sexes began? Genesis 3.16. With the battle of the sexes came, of course, the unnatural birth of the two-headed monster in the marriage. Wife wanting to be husband, husband domineering wife, and you have a two-headed freak in the home. That is the opposite of creation. You also have the equal and opposite outcome the decapitation of the head in the home. What do I mean by that? There's really only two extremes for each category, maleness and femaleness. If the woman is usurping the authority of headship, the man either responds by being aggressive in his masculinity, sinful, or passive in his masculinity, sinful and she dominates him, and he doesn't set the spiritual course of his home. For the woman, two extremes. You either have independent femininity, I don't need no man. I think there was a song out there that suggested that as well, right? I don't need no man. I'm married, but I'm not going to even take my husband's name. Because I don't need no man. I don't need a man's name. I'm not gonna let a man fit me into a box. I'm just gonna keep my daddy's name, who's also a man. (laughs) I'm I'm just pointing out the obvious. Or it doesn't lead to an independent woman. It leads to a subordinate woman or wife. And that's not good either. Subordinate, lesser. I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. I'm gonna let the man step all over me. No! The reason why we're out of balance in the home and in the church is because we're not letting God define gender responsibilities. Listen, before I was married, before I had in-laws, my in-laws now knew me as an outlaw. Let me (laughs) add context. When the Peterson family entered into my world, I was an inmate of the state. All right, and I could call Sarah and mine's relationship a courtship. We sincerely wanted to have Christ at the center, even though we were literally on different playing fields. And before my parents and her parents got together and exchanged the goats, 
her mom and dad were concerned, right, and rightfully so, because they understood headship, biblical headship, that if Matt and Sarah are going to be in relationship, we're curious, what's Matt's personality dynamic? They knew their daughter, Sarah, if you know her, she can be very strong-willed, very forceful, and they were concerned that if Sarah was matched up with a guy who was passive, she would step all over him. So they sent me in what is called a pro scan, right? It's more or less like a leadership assessment, personality, compatibility test, right? So here I am, an, an inmate of the state, and I'm taking this pro scan, and it has different you know, levels, like either dominant traits, right, as a man, <laughs> or conformity traits. And it's, it's useful to help match up like your role in a company or on a team. Is this making sense? So there I am and I'm doing my absolute best to fill out every question, to be honest about my personality, compatibility, and my dynamic in leadership. A couple questions I needed to ask some of my peers and I was certain to note that when I sent it back to Mr. and Mrs. Peterson. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Peterson, Please know, I consulted with Bubba and Teardrop. <laughs> and they want you to know that they think I'll be just fine. <laughs> Why did they do that? They weren't seeing if I was gonna crush their daughter. They were making sure that I had the, the makeup spiritually to channel their daughter. Because if I'm not leading from a posture of humility, Headship, then I will do more damage. Are you understanding how this is like a ballroom dance? Do I have any ballroom dancers up in here? I know, I think of Kate and George Turner. I think of so many, I see your videos on Facebook. I'm like, oh my God, who, who would have thought they're on the dance floor cutting it up? But if you were to ask Kate, generally speaking, it's the man that leads in the ballroom dance. Right, And I've never seen, you could probably find a video out there, it's not, it, I've never seen a female holding up a male in the figure skating. <laughs> you ever seen that? No, because there's gender differences. And I'll also say nobody's watching the male when he's lifting up the female in the figure skating. Even though he might be doing more work, we're all watching the female. Wow, how graceful. This is the proper template for husband and wife. This is headship. Ephesians 5 is where we'll be. You can turn there now, you'll find it close to 1 Timothy. Just go backwards, left in your Bibles. While you're going to Ephesians 5, I want to be very clear when I speak of headship in marital relationship, it's going to make sense for the church. Interestingly, Ephesians 5 is the redemption of Genesis 3.16. When that hit my spirit, I was like, oh my goodness. Ephesians 5, New Testament, with Christ being the head of the church, man being the head of wife, that's the redemption. That's the proper order. That is the balance of the curse that you see in Genesis 3.16. Headship is not about authority and responsibility minus of humility. Note that. Men, it's not just about I'm the head of my home. In fact, when you act that way and you're not in your rightful biblical position, I could think of another body part that you're acting like that's not the head. <laughs> headship is about humility. Headship is about service, not status. Yes, Ephesians two, before I get to Ephesians five, Philippians two, excuse me, Philippians two, the ultimate example of headship. It tells us in, in Philippians two, First of all, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. All right, good place to start. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is body language. This is corporate gathering language. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, ready? Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, equality. Jesus is equally God. Jesus, the Son, has equality with the eternal Father. It's said that way because you can't steal something or rob something that is rightfully yours. Jesus did not rob the nature of God by saying he was God. No, 
he had rightful access to it because of who he was, but watch what he does. But made himself of no reputation, different equity. He chose to submit to his father. Different equity and how it materializes. Listen to the language. Made himself of no reputation, taken the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. Can you go lower than that? God in the flesh? Yeah, humbled himself to the position of death. Can you go lower than that? Yeah, even the death of the cross. This is Jesus. This is the head of the church. This is the one with all authority. This is the one that knew who he was, radical awareness of who he was. Knew he came from God, knew he was going back to God, and decided to wash his disciples' feet. Let me say it again, headship is not about status. Headship is about service. Q Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I, I get it. People cringe when they read that one verse alone. I get it. Here's why we cringe. Because our nature is sinful. And nature of man does not submit on its own. Our nature is rebellious, any authority. That's why our ones and twos and threes and four-year-olds, you don't have to tell them how to rebel. Amen? Amen. They're just going to rebel. But I need you to underline, either in your mind or in your Bible, as to the Lord here. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This as to the Lord command it helps you keep your focus. Now, let me say this, because I wanna answer questions that I know are coming. I have the same stance, biblically, for headship, for husband and wife, Ephesians 5 dynamic, that I do for Romans 13 dynamic. I would never tell a wife to submit to a husband where your submission is, is sinful, where you're doing something outside of God's direct commands for you as a Christian, and as a woman, does that make sense? Just as I would never tell a church to submit blindly to the government, the moment their commandments contradict God's commandments, you do not submit. Amen. Until then, until then, it says wives submit as to the Lord. And then it tells you why. For the husband is head of the wife, also as Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, does he force us to submit? Does Christ force his children to submit? Yeah, it's free will. It's willful submission and how he leads. Let's keep reading. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Keep reading. We often stop and get so agitated because we're taking the paradigm of the world and the culture when it comes to this idea behind submission. I'm not gonna submit to no man. Yeah, he may not be living up to his potential and calling, and he may be missing the biblical implications. He may be passive. He may be lazy. But ladies, submission is respectful to that God-given authority unless it causes you to be sinful. Is this making sense? Because the next several verses are for the husband. Husbands, love your wives. How do I love my wife? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now you're understanding headship. Headship is not ruling over. Headship is actually serving under. You can't get around this. Headship is standing side by side with your counterpart, your wife. Headship has you holding her hand as equal, but make no mistake, different e equity. Because if I'm walking down that alley, listen, if I'm in my bedroom and I hear noise downstairs, I'm not sending Sarah to tend to it. If there's a spider to be dealt with, that's a different story. <laughs> I'm not dealing with spiders. But I will deal with an intruder. Let me say it like this. Not every man is 
has to be a fighter, but every man has to have some fight, especially when it comes to protecting women and children. Not every, I'm a fighter. And the Lord has harnessed that fight for spiritual purposes these days. But I'm saying, not every man is going to be, have the proclivity to fight, but there should be a fight in every man. Is that making sense? All right, I'm on rabbit trails. Let me move on. That he, Christ, might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That's awesome. This is an illustration of what Christ does with his church, how he sanctifies us and makes us more beautiful in the process. He doesn't submit us and force us. He doesn't behaviorally modify us. He transforms us. He comes alongside of us. He deals with us. He emotionally deals with us. He spiritually deals with us. He physically deals with us in such a gentle and gracious yet firm way that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen? Okay. But that she should be holy and without blemish. Translation, yes, physically speaking, our bodies are breaking down. And as a marriage ages, yes, the man and the woman are aging chronologically, and you could see the effects of that physically, but I could tell you the truth those of us in this room who have beautiful marriages and you've been married for a long time, your wife is getting more beautiful spiritually and emotionally because you are maturing more spiritually and emotionally because you're washing her with the word of God and you're sanctifying her because Jesus has modeled it for the church. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. As our own bodies? Question, men. If we were to either be judged by the way we treated our wife, how would that translate in the way we take care of our bodies? Think about that. If in an instant, the way you treat your counterpart, your wife, your spouse, the Lord translated it or converted it, like currency, he converts it, and in an instant, the effect on your body would be instant. What would that look like? Would your body be beat up because that's how you've been treating your wife? Or would your body be built up? Is this making sense? And I'm not saying it from being a perfect husband. Sarah will get on this stage and tell you where I fall short, but she knows my heart wants to strive to be a better man of God to make sure I'm in my rightful biblical place as the head of my home. He who loves his wife loves himself. Conversely, he who hates his wife hates himself. I guess what I'm trying to say using Ephesians 5 and headship is the fact that the failure of men to lead in the home and in the church in the way Jesus led and in the way the scriptures are read has resulted in the world accusing masculinity of being toxic. And they reject authority of all kinds, not only because, but partially because men in the home and in the church have shirked their responsibility as leaders. See, a non-binary approach to the family and the church has only perpetuated the consequences of the curse. When we go into the family and say gender roles and responsibilities don't matter, or we come even into the church of Jesus Christ and say gender roles and responsibilities don't matter, we've, we've only perpetuated and advanced the result of the curse from Genesis chapter three, verse 16. Now, remember the verses from last week? I, I hope to have taught them in a balanced way. I hope you didn't leave beat up. I hope you left encouraged, but I wanna just read them because we just did a lot of work on the front end about headship and the home and gender specificity so that you would understand when Paul writes to Timothy, let a woman learn in peace with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. When you understand where he's deriving this thought from, you don't get 
hit between the eyes and go, man, that's offensive. You go, no, that makes sense. Women were allowed to learn as long as they did so at peace, not contentious, not talking out of turn, which is what the problem was in the church at Corinth, talking to their husbands during the, the, the service, and that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 is like, hey, or 14, chapter 14 or 11, both are awesome. Go home and ask your husbands. He is laying down a creative order that is not cultural. God's word is binding, does not change. We get out of those verses and he adds verse 15. Nevertheless, I know that was hard to swallow. Nonetheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. It's perfect. I know it, it's one of the hardest verses to really interpret, but in context, it's not that complicated. He's not just speaking of Eve, and of course, in the midst of the curse came the greatest blessing. In the midst of the curse in Genesis 3 came the fact that the Messiah would come through Eve, or a woman, the seed of the woman, that would eventually crush the head of the serpent and he would bruise his heel. It's a picture of the cross and the ultimate redemption of mankind from the fall, of, from sin and death. And he's also saying, hey, that's gonna happen, but let's get real practical. Ladies, God has given you a unique role and responsibility in childbearing. I believe that is not just physical, I believe it's also spiritual. Ladies have a proclivity, a bent to be motherly, to be more nurturing, generally speaking, more compassionate. Guys, look at me. Which is why when you see certain movements, the pro-choice movement is often spearheaded by women. And that is counterintuitive to the nature of a woman that God designed her to be more motherly and she is crying out and calling for the abortion of the child. Do you wonder, this is, this is a result of the curse. Women are typically teachers. Doesn't mean men can't be teachers. Why is that? Because it's the way God has wired you. To be in the classroom with the kids discipling them. We have amazing teachers in this fellowship that are working to serve the Lord in the public square. Did you know that? We have amazing individuals who are deciding to run for school boards so that they can disciple our children in a godly manner. Back to verse 15. He's saying to women of all ages, Oh, I gotta rephrase that. Through the ages, it would be childbearing that would reverse the desire to usurp the authority of your husband. God has given women that specific and unique role and only women can fulfill it. Is this making sense? The, the question is not where do we rule? The answer is you rule in that role. I don't have enough time to talk about obviously the, in the various cases where women can't bear children. I know that has to be extremely difficult. My heart goes out to any woman or man in that dynamic that is struggling to, to bear children. God sees you, he truly does. Paul has just written that women are not to hold positions of spiritual or doctrinal authority over congregations. Why? Because of creative order. But he did not wanna leave the false impression that just any man is qualified to serve as a spiritual leader in the church. In fact, no man is qualified simply because of his gender, which is interesting. Okay, watch this. Chapter three is not separate of chapter two. We read it that way. We close down chapter two, right? We step on a few landmines here and there. We kind of 
take a big sigh and we move into chapter three as if it's disconnected from the context of chapter two. And I'm here to tell you, it's not only not disconnected, it's extremely spiritually engineered in the language. He is saying, oh, you think this is a male versus female issue? And that's how the world wants you to hash it out, argue between equality and equity between male and female. He's like, no, this isn't a male versus female issue. This is a human versus God's authority issue. Because chapter three begins by instructing us what the church dynamic looks like. And not every male, because of their gender, is qualified to have a spiritual authority over a body. Let me read those verses in their entirety, and then we'll get to work. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Man, gender specific. A bishop then must be blameless. Translation, above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Verse four, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Verse five, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Wow. Verse seven, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside the non-believing world, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let me just give you one spiritual point. I'm gonna teach that over the next several weeks as the Lord would will. Not gonna teach it now, but one spiritual point. Those are qualifications for your spiritual leaders in the church. It's male-driven. It's male-specific. These are the qualifications. But for any of us that are striving for God's calling in our life, let me be very clear when I say this. God's calling on a life will never contradict his written word. God's calling on a life will never contradict his written word, which means a woman can't say she's called to be a bishop or an elder in a church because that contradicts God's written word. It's very clear. Nor can a man say, I'm called to be a bishop or a pastor in the church if it contradicts God's written word about the qualifications. Is this making sense? Okay, let's go a little bit deeper, and I'm not teaching this. I just wanna be very clear as I set the stage, and our time is short. This is a faithful saying, verse one. Translation and slang, believe this. You can believe this. You can bank on this. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The word bishop here, is the word episkopos. It's where we get episcopalian. It means farseer or overseer. The word bishop here is interchangeable with overseer, sometimes shepherd, sometimes pastor. That is why this role often has interchangeability. Landmark believes that not every elder overseer is a pastor. And not everybody in the pastor role is an elder. We see a distinction in the scriptures. We have a website where you can read about those responsibilities and those requirements. But what is being said here, this is admirable. A man that desires to be an overseer, this is honorable. He's saying this is not just a good work, this is gonna be a hard work. And again, understanding what is being desired, this is where we go wrong. I want a position in the church. Right away, you're off on the wrong foot. Let me take you to Mark chapter 10 really quick. I just wanna read to you what Jesus had to say. Listen to the language, please. The language is so precise. Mark 10, verse 42. You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you, ready? Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Did you catch the language? You have a desire to be great, Jesus says? You have a desire to have authority, Jesus says? That person will be servant of all. You have a desire, man, to be an, a bishop or an overseer? That's a good work but it's undergirded by God's work. That is why it's not just an outward desire. I said this about Paul's calling in message number one. A calling is not something you aspire to as much as it's something you're inspired to. Can I tell you the heart of your pastor? 
my calling in the body, whether here or elsewhere, this is not just a good option for me. This is the only option for me. I could do nothing but serve the body of Christ because that's my calling. That's not the case for everyone. And the Lord has placed each of us in different dynamics to serve him where he's placed us. See, even this argument about male versus female is again, split again. Because it's not just any male. It's even a small subset of male that God chooses and ordains to serve his church. I'll talk way more about the responsibilities of an overseer in a separate message, but for now, let's jump to verse four and five as we close. Verse four, one who rules his own house well. The word is manage. The word is sets an example. The word is ruling in the midst of, not lording over. Having his children in submission with all reverence, all right, so those that are under your care are going to be obedient to an extent. And then the rhetorical question, which really I thought this was amazing. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? You know why I found that amazing? Because we just spent about 40 minutes talking about headship in the home. And you may have been wondering, what's that got to do with the church? For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, headship, how in the world will he take care of the church of God? So what does having your children in submission with all reverence look like? Can I use an illustration? Can I show you what my two and a half year old son looks like in submission to his dad? If you were to ask him, how is his father doing with headship in the home? Yeah, this is what you would get. Zeke, 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 what do you love most about your dad? <laughs> that can go, this can go one of two ways. That either just got me disqualified as an elder or I have some questions for our children's ministry and what they're teaching those kids. <laughs> See, as we close, in this passage, which we will eventually get to, we see that it is in the home where our Christianity is first demonstrated. We also see where it's God's creative order is reiterated. That's what verse four and five does. D.L. Moody said it like this. If I wanted to find out whether a man was a Christian, I wouldn't go and ask his minister. I would go and ask his wife. We need more Christian life at home. If a man doesn't treat his wife right, I don't wanna hear him talk about Christianity. Wow. Wow. Man, that, that quote struck me hard, right? Again, if you were to ask Sarah on any given day, there might be two different responses because I am not, I am not meeting the expectations of what it means to be a father and a husband. But my heart wants to. Some days I'm on it, some days I'm not. But the goal for the men and the women of this fellowship is to strive to be more like Christ. I believe if you become more like Christ in your role and your responsibility, the Lord will be glorified and those that are attached to you will be edified. That's just how it works. So I'm gonna pray and I believe this moment of communion for us, I believe it's going to be personal for each of us. I believe mothers and wives and women, I believe fathers, husbands and men, I believe those in between, boys and girls, I believe each of us, if we take this moment with the Lord, we ask him to do his greatest work in our hearts to make us more like his son. I believe we would come out of this moment of communion thankful for what Jesus has redeemed, that his blood has completely forgiven me from all of my transgressions, all of my sins, and that his body was lended and given to me for a brand new beginning. I believe if you take that moment seriously, 
whether doing so with your spouse, whether doing so in mind of your children, I believe the Spirit will begin to work in this body and we will be healthier for it. So Father, I pray just that. I pray that for these people before me. I pray your word was clear. I pray that you would challenge the men, convict us, humble us, forgive us, give us a greater portion of your spirit. Not that we would be beat down and beat up, but Lord, that we would be built up. You already see us as the men you intend us to be, so help us, Holy Spirit. And I pray the same for our ladies. There's different relationship dynamics, oh Lord, and I pray that you become the center of it all. I pray we all reach our spiritual potential in you. I pray as we partake in communion, we would make it personal. It would be an intimate moment that we would literally cry out to you for your aid, your help, your assistance, for where we fall short, where we need to be humbled, where we're hard, soften us, where we're soft, firm it up. Put your blessing upon these people. In the name of Jesus, I pray this, amen.